Yes, so uh, whenever, Colin, you are ready to give your presentation on universal basic income, I will give the floor to you. Yeah, great. Um, is, is my screen sharing correctly? Am I good? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, I will say this is kind of uh, universal basic income is my socio-political hill to die on. I'm super for this policy. Um, so just to talk a little bit about it in origin, this is not really a new idea. It's been around since the French Revolution. Um, it actually has a really wide range of political support. Most recently, you can see Andrew Yang is kind of what brought it back again, but Richard Nixon, Martin Luther King, Thomas Paine, Milton Friedman, all of these are big proponents of, uh, of UBI. But uh, UBI can have so many different forms that it's important to talk about the context of what specifically um, you mean in terms of this debate for UBI. So there are a lot of different amounts that have been suggested in terms of payments. Um, the 1000 is kind of the medium of the most realistic side of these arguments. So it's basically $1,000 tax-free income every month for a total of 12 grand a year. But there are some people that say they want a middle class existence for a universal basic income. And then there are theories about you know, six figure incomes that would basically have everyone living in wealth. That's kind of science fiction. Um, but uh, today we're gonna be talking about just the $1,000 payment a month. So $1,000 monthly is basically 12 grand a year of tax-free income, which at 329 million Americans is right around $4 trillion. Um, to put this in perspective, this is 15% of the current debt, not deficit. So this is not a cheap endeavor. So I think the most important thing to talk about in terms of setting up this payment before we get into the economic arguments is how specifically to actually pay for it. Um, part of the suggestions off of Yang's platform were to be doing something called a value added tax of 10%. This is a very common tax. It's considered a fair tax and is kind of similar to a sales tax, it adds a tax value onto certain goods and services at every step of their kind of economic transition. Um, and at a like 10% rate, this would net us around $800 billion in income. And the other thing that um, a UBI does is it can consolidate welfare programs. So UBI would be there in place of something like food stamps. And because a lot of these economic uh, welfare programs create a ceiling where if you earn enough income, you lose your benefits. And sometimes the cost of that can actually leave you off poorer than where you were. So in place of some of these uh, uh, welfare programs, a UBI would offer a floor that you could lift yourself up off of instead of a ceiling that would be more of an economic cap. Um, and then a couple of other ideas to uh, implement the actual pain for this are things like an enviro tax. So carbon tax, pollution tax, and these would also have the benefit of helping internalize some of the externalities that are going on in that industry. And finally, it would reduce the cost of poverty, which is not something that I think a lot of people think about in, immediately in terms of an economic standpoint. But um, poverty is actually a really big problem on our economy. You can see some of the rates adjusted for the cost of living, and it's not like the U.S. is free of this issue. Um, and the figures on the right, these are going to show just the cost in billions of dollars um, of just child poverty. So this is not even the full weight that we bear, but these alone in the US are, uh, again, a cost of upwards $1 trillion a year. So this is something that we need to actually actively mitigate economically speaking, or we're just losing money. Um, and then one other thing that I think could definitely be something to consider in terms of reallocating funds, because we're not just going to be printing off money to hand out for a UBI, is, you know, looking at the defense budget. We currently pay more than $300 billion more than the other top five countries combined. So China, India, Russia, and Saudi could all gain, gang up on us, and we'd still outclass them in terms of $300 of military asset at our disposal. Um, so, but talking about the actual economic impact of implementing this specific UBI plan is it would see at uh, somewhere between 12 and 13% increase in our total GDP, which is right around the tune of $202.5 trillion. Supplementing this with a 10% VAT tax is going to net us an additional $800 billion and set us at a course of around $3.2 trillion. 
If we factor in the consolidation of the welfare programs that are going to be consolidated, or consolidation of the welfare programs, as well as a potential reduction in the cost of poverty, we've already paid for the program. This is where the point of marginal benefits kicks in. Um, and it will also show increases in employment, real GDP, nominal wages, and the marginal propensity to consume on all sides of the economic spectrum. Um, and part of this payment is that it is universal. So the rich will get $1,000 just as much as the poor, but the difference is, is there are more people that are not rich, so they're gonna be having a greater economic impact. And for every dollar that goes to wage earners, that's a return of $1.21 into the economy versus only 39 cents for a return on, the, uh, on higher tax bracket consumers. So this is gonna do more good for more people. Then there are also the intangibles of what happens when you implement this program. Um, people are healthier. There's shown to be correlations with lower hospital visits and workplace injuries. There's lower rates of homelessness, stress, mental illness. And most, uh, most importantly, and this is a big concern of Yang's as well, is a UBI is a solution to the upcoming very real problem of automation. Um, most, if not, I'd say about like, you know, the majority of jobs in the US in the next 20, 30, or 40 years are, are in pretty serious danger. There are AI and machine learning programs that are learning to do any tasks that re it is repetitive and some creative tasks. Um, I was listening to a podcast the other day with Yang on it and they're actually talking about how jobs like oncology and some of the like, you know, the things that people go to school for years for are in danger of being automated, which is gonna be a serious detriment to our economy. Um, is the figure here is that by the early 2030s, we're going to lose 38% of jobs um, in certain districts to automation. It's going to affect every sector, and it's primarily going to affect the people that don't earn as much. So the lower incoming classes are going to bear the brunt of this um, economic loss, which is kind of sad because the whole point of automation, in my opinion, is that you know this is the point that we're striving for to achieve freedom from just menial work but it's, it's turning into just a detriment to the economy instead, which is not what anyone wants. Um, so just taking, for example, uh, an industry like truck drivers, you know, this is a huge industry in the United States. It's 6% of all employment. And all of these guys are gonna be out of jobs in the next 20 years because they're looking at, you know, self-driving cars is already something we have. Implementing that into mass, uh, mass transport is not a novel idea, nor is it one that's very far off. And these are going to be low class, low education, not a lot of trade skill workers that if we don't stimulate that economy proactively, that's going to look at a major detriment to our GDP as a whole. Um, so to kind of recap everything about my opening arguments is that this is an economically beneficial program. It's going to show rates of increased growth, employment, GDP, all sorts of benefits. And it's been signed on to by economists, professors, and world leaders. It'll have plenty of social benefits, homelessness, hunger, mental illness, all that sort of thing. They're going to go down. People are going to be able to be better educated, spend more time with their family. It'll allow low-income workers to debate better working conditions because they'll have the financial levity to do so. And as I mentioned earlier, it'll provide a floor for people to stand up and raise themselves up from, which is what I know a lot of the older generation like to say the phrase, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's not possible in this current economy. That's not how you escape poverty. But an implementation of a program like this could certainly um, help in that regard. But yeah, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Um, anybody have any questions right now? Oops. Questions? Um, just on, on what was presented before I spend a little bit of time talking. Very, very, very good presentation. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, I, I don't know if I even have anything I want to share. Um, <laughs> I just, I'll just talk rather than share some slides. Should I go ahead? You ready, Colin? Yeah. Ready, ready to have your arguments taken down? No, I'm not going to take down your arguments. What, what, are, what are some of the arguments against universal basic income? Well, I think anyone has to start with 
if we pass a universal basic income in this country, that will raise the national debt. Because the money that the government has to spend on paying for the universal basic income, it's almost impossible to think that that will be raised with new taxes. I mean, it, it, it is possible. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say it's impossible. I should say it's improbable. Why? Because it's a lot harder to raise taxes than it is to raise spending. Okay, so and and the evidence for that is just look what's happened in this country in the last in the last twenty years. We had a budget, we had a budget surplus in in the year two thousand. I think going into two thousand and one, and just uh, budget deficits just keep getting worse and worse. Starting with George W. Bush and um, a lot of, I, I think I actually think George W. Bush's administration started. I, I'm getting off on a tangent here. I'm doing a very bad job of making my point through a debate question. Be succinct. Don't be like me. Be succinct when you're giving your debates. But here's here's my point. It's really easy to pass an increase in spending in this country, and UBI would be that a massive increase in spending it's much, much harder to pass an increase in taxes. That, and, and a huge increase of taxes would be needed to pay for this UBI. Therefore, we, we have to just assume the debt is going to go up, the national debt. And there are some economic consequences to that, which I've talked about, but um, just to rattle them off, there uh, is a crowding out effect. There's less investment in, in the public, in the private sector when people are investing in bonds. Um, interest rates are likely to go up. The amount of interest that we have to pay on the debt we already have is likely to go up. Uh, and that's a, that's a kind of subtle point. What, I'm, what I mean by that is um, the government spends money to pay off bondholders in the form of interest, but the rate at which they have to pay their interest on, on those loans is likely to go up if the national debt goes up significantly. Um, you can argue about the, 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 the size of that increase, but there should be some increase in that. And do I have a third point? Oh, just that there's a Ricardian equivalence that says if you increase the debt now, future taxpayers will have to pay that. There that will correspond to an increase in taxes. It's almost Here's the argument. Maybe it's unfair to say that people now are going to get these benefits from the UBI and our children and our grandchildren are going to have to pay for it in the form of higher taxes. You hear this argument a lot from the conservatives, fiscal conservatives. Okay, so that was the first argument that the UBI will increase the debt and there are negative consequences to that. Second argument, uh, UBI reduces incentives to work um, okay, so here, here, here's this argument. Uh, if you give people a, a universal basic income, it means they no longer uh, feel the, that it's absolutely essential for them to work. They have, they have this other income that they could fall back on. And it could be that on the margin, somebody's trying to decide, do I really want to work at a job that's you know five miles away and I don't have a car, I have to take a bus? It's, it's unpleasant to work. If you give people another option to say, well, you can, you can survive on this basic income, you don't need to work, it could be that it makes a lot of people choose not to work. And therefore, the, 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 the size of our employment pool will reduce, and you could argue this might, the economic consequence of that could be um, lower productivity for certain firms, the ones that rely on labor, um, of course, I, okay, aside, Colin made a really great point that says that, it, it, I shouldn't be saying this in my, in my half of the debate, but uh, if we are transitioning to automation, what I just said is not true, that it's more productive to have human workers uh, to pay and, and to pay human workers a low wage. Um, it's very possible that the technology of the future changes that, but okay, close that aside. Uh, I'll, I'll play the economic uh, card that says, the inputs of, of, of production are capital and labor. They're both necessary and having a larger supply of labor by having people being willing to work 
ultimately makes our economy more productive. Okay, and uh, so that, that was, that was the, my second argument was UBI reduces the incentives to work. And then the third argument, uh, okay, so if we pass a universal basic income, this must be accompanied with a reduction in other social welfare programs. It's simply not possible or feasible to think we're gonna have a UBI on top of these other social welfare programs. And in fact, Colin's presentation, he acknowledged that. He said, if we pass UBI, we'll be able to reduce, we'll save money on, um, save money on food stamps, maybe Medicaid, maybe um, certain types of social security or, or whatever. Programs that already exist will be reduced. And he actually argued that that was a good thing, or at least a cost-saving thing. And I will agree that would save, you know, you, you don't have to spend money on UBI and food stamps. Maybe you could say reduce the food stamps. Uh, here's the economic argument why it might be a bad thing to get rid of these means-tested programs. And the argument is the means are there for a reason. It, we may not ag personally agree with it, uh, but every time there's a social program like food stamps, I think uh, temporary assistance for needy families or the supplemental nutrition program, SNAP, uh, these sorts of programs, they have these conditions, right? They say that you cannot get this benefit unless you do this particular thing, unless your income is below a certain level or unless uh, you at least attempt to, so unemployment benefits, for example, you only get those if you are still actively looking for work. And my argument is, maybe those means are there for a reason. Um, they, were, they were voted in a Congress, and in fact, we live in a democracy where we elect people who are going to make laws, and they chose to make laws to have these means in place. And by getting rid of those social welfare programs that are means tested and replacing them with a universal basic income. The word universal means that everyone gets it. There's no, there's no requirements. You simply, you simply, uh, by virtue of being a citizen, I believe we're talking about for citizenship. Uh, yeah. So just, if you're a citizen, you get the UBI. And, and the economic argument there is that there could be some incentives or, or uh, yeah, some, some rationale for why these means are in place and, and therefore we, getting rid of that may, may be bad. Okay, that was, that was the last argument. I have. Those are the only three that I have. Um, okay, so that, that concludes my uh, arguments against the universal basic income. I would like to give it back to Colin if, he, if you're interested then you can sort of rebut what I just said. Um, or if not, we can have a discussion, but actually let's go to Colin first. Would, would you like some time, Colin? Yeah. Um, okay. So just to, to address those three points in Great. order. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely undeniable that this program is going to increase the deficit. There is going to be more spending, but this is going to be an investment into the lowest common denominator of the American citizenry which is uh, uh, consequently the majority. This is going to do the most good for the most people in terms of economic policy. This is going to be an example of reverse Keynesian economics, the trickle up effect. The more money that we're able to invest in the lower wage classes, the more that's going to stimulate the economy and make us a better society on the whole. It is going to cost something, but it's also going to help mitigate the loss and the economic downturn that automation is going to bring in the next couple of decades. Um, in terms of a reduction of welfare programs, that actually is part of, of the process. The, there is going to be a little bit of job loss in terms of that regard, and there are going to be a loss of benefits over time. The implementation of the program is that people at the moment, in terms of Yang's policy specifically, um, is you basically could choose between certain benefits or the UBI. And on the whole, reducing welfare programs is actually going to be a good thing because it cuts down a lot on bureaucracy. There's going to be less governmental bureaucracy, which is going to make it a more efficient system. 
Um, plus, isn't the less people on welfare or the less people on Medicaid a good thing? That means there are less people that are dependent on these ceiling inducing policies. You mentioned you have to apply for a certain number of jobs with unemployment. Some states have conditions where you have to take any job that you want. So if, uh, Professor, if you lost your job, despite the fact that you have like, you know, degrees of higher education and experience, if KFC offers you a job, if you want to keep your unemployment, you now need to go work at KFC, which is a huge example of economic inefficiency. And then finally, the incentive to work. This is, this is a major rhetorical argument, argument against UBI, and it's something that actually is not based in a lot of empirical evidence. Um, in the 1970s, an experiment was run in the town of Dauphin, California, a population of 12,000. They were all given a UBI to live on. There was no loss in productivity, negligible loss in hours worked. And in fact, the people that didn't um, work as much were either single mothers that were at home to take care of their kids more, or people that took time off to either further their education or look for better jobs. So they're educating themselves, working at a higher level in the economy. That is a stimulant in and of itself. And it also kind of plays to the notion that people that accept um, any sort of welfare are lazy or they're gonna squander it on booze and drugs and that sort of thing. Um, and you know, part of the universal aspect is if everyone's getting it, that takes away the stigma that people have about people in need of a, receiving uh, governmental funds. And next, in the MIT study, in, 2016, and there's a ton of other research on this sort of thing as well. Um, there's no evidence that people that are more in those lower class uh, brackets squander their money on drugs and alcohol. In fact, the rich are way more likely to uh, consume those sort of products. In fact, financial decision, decision making is actually improved with financial security. If, we, if everyone is $1,000 more secure, everyone makes $1,000 smarter of economic decisions because that amount of money just monthly is, is world changing to so many in our population that you know, it gives them the ability to just take a breath from the constant stress of poverty and think about long term instead of just trying to get the next paycheck so that their power isn't cut out. Um, but overall, I, I'm super for this program and that's, that kind of, that concludes my rebuttal. Great, thank you very much. Um, I was going to say uh, they don't have to use payday loans, for example, if uh, if they have an extra thousand a month, and they're like if they're living paycheck to paycheck and sort of losing that battle in, in the sense that they run out of money every month, they can be stuck in this situation where you're you're getting you're taking loans at an extremely high interest rate, and um, in fact, it's, it's it's a bit predatory that that industry uh, always props up wherever people are struggling to make ends meet and, and sort of takes advantage of that. So, yeah. Um, did, did, uh, some of the people here, that, there were five of you that were against UBI. Would, would anyone like to give um, a reason for, for why they would be against it? Just another argument? And is anybody, or four, I'm just, is, is there anyone from the audience who wrote about it for your homework, for, exa for example, and uh, just wants to express what they said in, in their homework? I guess my question would be, uh, what about reform of the needs tested system we have now? Um, I just think that merits a little more discussion maybe. Um, in the fact that UBI maybe disincentivizes um, a lot of the systematic structural issues that exist currently, um, it, in a lot of ways in some, uh, I don't know, in some areas it could be seen as a sort of a band-aid that kind of satiates everyone to enough of a degree as long as the UBI uh, in um, the UBI uh, is high enough I suppose um, maybe you know it it uh, it creates a sort of a, in the way that the tax system today creates a sort of status quo where the government kind of subsidizes the extremely wealthy's uh, workforce, I guess. Okay, so you, your argument is it would be better for us to reform the social welfare programs we have uh, because the UBI maybe is a bit too extreme. It, it'll, it'll change things too much. Is that maybe partly what you're arguing? Um, just maybe not targeted enough or not, uh, targeted. not efficient enough at, at its goal. Okay. Yeah, um, I tried to bring that up a little bit of that, that the means-tested programs have a means for a reason, 
And we, you give that up when you make it universal. Um, yeah, um, I, 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 thanks, thanks for the, uh, the comment. Anyone agree or disagree? Colin, do you have any, you good? I mean, I'll talk about, go ahead. No, no, I'm good. Um, you, you kept talking about the welfare floor. Yeah, I, I like that too. Um, and that's much better than a welfare uh, ceiling or in fact, the word is cliff. Does everybody know what that means when you talk about a welfare cliff? It could be that your benefits, like you're getting these sort of welfare benefits and then there's a cliff so it's you're really in your mind, you're thinking there's a graph where on the, on the x-axis is your income and on, on the y-axis are your total benefits that you receive and sort of in terms of all the social welfare programs combine all of those benefits and put them on a single graph. There is a bit of a cliff in this country and that I would argue that's a bad thing. And I think that's what Colin was arguing a little bit too, that if people realize they're getting close to this social welfare cliff, they're going to be really disincentivized not to work. They don't want it. They don't want to raise. If their boss says, hey, you know, we can give you $15 an hour instead of 12, uh, but you have to work the same number of hours. There could be some people out there who say, actually, no, if I do that, I'm going to lose my food stamps. And that's a bit crazy, isn't it? Um, okay, I'm arguing for UBI right now by saying, if by making some a policy universal, there is no cliff. There, there is no point at which you stop receiving the UBI. In fact, everyone receives it. That's why it's universal. Uh, so I thought that was a great point that you made, Colin. Um, oh, by the way, you gave this fact that there would be approximately a 12% increase in GDP. 12%. That's really significant. I, GDP growth is currently 1%, 2%, 3%. It's pretty low. To jump from that to 12% is huge. And that's a and, big uh, claim. Yeah, it's, um, so that one specifically comes from the, uh, the, the study that they did in the 70s in Canada, which is, again has the sample size of 12,000. So it's, it's yeah. not a small study. This is an entire um, independent economic system that had, had this implemented. And it actually had 13.3% growth, but correlative estimates growth placed the range. Do you, know, do you happen to know what, what grew? The spending? Uh, the GDP, um, like as a whole for the, the town. Of the town? Uh -huh. that's, an, that's an odd thing. That's an odd thing, in my opinion. That's an odd thing to use as a metric. Because an economy is, is a very big thing. Very big thing. The, the way we, as an economy, produce things is not at all individualistic. It's very large corporations are producing things, very large factories, very, you know, abstract sort of, you know, institutions, maybe they're financial institutions. And you say, how is that adding to the GDP? Well, technically um, it is. Can, um, I, can I actually amend myself? That is not from, I was just double checking my sources. That's not from the 1970s experiments in uh, Canada. It is, uh, is a study done in 2016 by the Roosevelt Institute on what the UBI would look like in America. So that is a specifically an implemented into uh, American economics. Good, so, but it is a prediction, right? This, there, there is no data that says if we do this UBI, there will be a 12% increase in GDP. I'm curious, what does the class think? Do, do we as a class, do we, do we buy this? That if everybody has an extra thousand dollars, then we'll all take that money and spend it and um, and then the people who receive the money from being from being spent will then turn around and spend some more of that, and the result of this will be more economic activity, which is basically what GDP measures. Do we actually think that the GDP would grow by approximately twelve percent? Because you know, if, if we can't agree on this, maybe that's part of the reason why we don't agree on UBI. Um, it, there could be some people who say, well, if we do this. The whole economy will be stronger and better. And then other people who say, actually, no, it's not. I'm, oh, is there chat? No, the chat, the chat isn't going at all. What do you guys think? No. So no, will, will the economy grow by 12% if we have a UBI? I, I think that um, in, in, in that circumstance, I do believe that, I mean, just generally speaking, the more 
capital that people have at their disposal is more capital that can be um what's it called um injected into the economy simple to put um as colin was saying in his argument and stuff like that is that i mean the more money that people have at their disposal the less they have to worry about the common basic needs that they um that they need in their life and stuff like that so like if you have that extra thousand dollars in your account i know for example as a college student if i have an extra thousand dollars in my account it can go a long way you know what i'm saying instead of having to worry about paying rent for the apartment or paying groceries and stuff like that i can use it maybe uh invest in a stock market do something that'll actually you know you know you know uh, benefit the economy in some way shape or form it's just more spending power realistically and so i, I do believe that it can it can increase um, our, our gdp by some ways Okay, so Daniel, Daniel says, yes, he does think it would increase the uh, GDP by 12%. I, I think that's what you were saying. Well, let's look at Ch Shane in the chat says, actually, he does not believe that this, that, that would increase our uh, economic growth to 12% um, because of less workforce participation. And then Colin, you say that actually stats, you mean like, like, um, I have statistical like evidence percent. in my research to point towards an increase in employment. Yeah. And you're, and you're basing that on like these test programs where they like take one city and give everyone in this city a uh, UBI and see how that changes their, and I, yes, I've heard, I've heard of these. Um, they're, they're actually kind of great experiments to do, right? Economists love experiments like this, where I take this pool of people and this pool, of, one's a control, one's a treatment, and I, I see how differently they behave. Um, and I, I, I agree with a bit of what Colin is saying, that it's not, uh, it's certainly not a major reduction in employment, like like some skeptics, like even I said in, in my argument that it would reduce the incentives to work. I do believe actually it does, in some sense, reduce the incentives to work. However, if you're getting a thousand dollars a month, you're not just going to say, okay, that's all I want. I never want any more money than that. It really is a floor, in my opinion. It really is like, okay, in case you just can't find work, or uh, like you said, Colin, um, it will allow you a chance to look for better jobs. That actually is, is really m more efficient than the case where everyone just has to take whatever the first job that's available to them, and they have to stay there because otherwise they'll have no, have no money. So you can make an economic argument now that's about matching. It's like you have a certain productivity capability, productive capability, and there's a firm out there who could really use you, and we want those two people to match. The word also is human capital. Whatever resources you have in terms of human capital, they're most productive at some firm. And if you can match yourself with that firm, then the economy is more productive. It's, it's actually efficient to do this. So, you know, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm arguing for the UBI right now that that, that is, that, even if there's some sort of temporary uh, reduction in employment because people are looking for a better job than the one they currently have, that could actually be a good thing. That could actually be a good thing for our economy. Great. Um, anybody else have any, anything else to say? Um, what do you guys think of that? I, I liked the cartoon. There was a cartoon with the guy the way things are, you lose your job and you're depressed because you now you have to think of some other way that to make an income and you know otherwise your family's going to starve. Like it, that that's a horrible thing if you lose your job in this country. Um, whereas, shouldn't it be that better improving our technology is a good thing? You know, we we've we've invented some machine that can perform this tech. Think about think about Star Trek. I'm sorry, you guys. Do you guys know what happens in Star Trek? At some point between now and when Star Trek takes place, they've invented a replicator. I think this machine is the most interesting machine ever in, in economic thought, <laughs> in, you know, like it purely as a, as a thought experiment. What happens when the first replicator gets produced? It means that there's no more scarcity, no more people like can't find food or, or anything. You just ask, you know, Captain Picard says, I'll take Earl Grey tea hot. And bam, it appears. You want food? It appears. It's like free food for anybody who wants it. Once, that's, once, we, once that happens, we live in a post-scarcity economy. What if we were so tied to our notions of capitalism that we said, okay, once we create this and there's post-scarcity, we're going to generate scarcity some other way and still 
prevent people from having food. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be just an, an incredible waste of this technology? Whereas in the, in the, okay, in the Star Trek universe, they've overcome that. They no longer, they, you don't ever see poor people in, in um, Star Trek because they have this, they've used this technology for good. Here's my point. You could imagine two different futures, one where we use the technology for good to help everybody, and another where we use this technology to create a bigger difference between the haves and the have-nots. And I think, as an economist, it's better, it's more efficient to, to go the way that Star Trek went. I would rather live in a future where um, we can all get the benefits of the replicator in the post-scarcity economy. And I thought the, 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 the cartoon had something to do with that, and I just, I thought that was a good point. Uh, sorry, so we've got some chats here. Uh, oh, were you, were you answering Ryan in the chat, Colin? Yeah, uh, yeah. I was to uh, both points, yeah. Um, uh, it just uh, a lot of the things that I'm saying are based strictly off of Yang's platform because it's the most detailed plan that's been presented recently in terms of US economics. Um, but social security and social disability would not be mutually exclusive with this program. So some of those things like veteran benefits, none of those are gonna be canceled out by accepting the UBI, but over time it could replace less inefficient ceiling programs like food stamps or SNAP or the ones that specifically have that cliff. Um, so the goal is in, in this to incentivize people to work more because if you are on those programs receiving benefits, the subject of welfare, you have incentive to stop at a certain point. With the UBI, I mean, 12,000 a year is not a lot to live off of. That is right around the poverty line. And in larger cities like New York, San Francisco, LA, $1,000 a month doesn't actually get you very far, but it still gives you that like, you know, you won't starve, you won't be cold out on the street. This is just the most effective universal treatment to those social problems, which at the end of the day, we pay the price for. Yeah, yeah, good answer. You guys were talking about real policy while I was talking about Star Trek, I apologize. Um, we, sh we, should, we should wrap this up. I think uh, it's been a good debate. It was a bit one-sided, uh, but that's okay. Um, would anyone, would we like to, I'm, okay, this isn't for a grade, but um, I, I do like to just record or make some note of if anybody switched their position from before the debate to after. So before the debate, we had five, four, five and five. Myron, Ryan, Daniel, Shrias, Hennick were four. Tina, Shane, Nick, he and Robert were against. I'm, I'm curious, has anybody um, over this debate decided to switch and maybe they support the other side and what they started? If so, will you please tell me in the chat? In, in class, in, when, when we had in-person classes, I made people vote and I like, I could see your faces and I would say, what, what do you say for or against? And then, you know, everyone would have to vote. I have no way of forcing you to vote because you're, you're somewhere else. But um, if you would please let me know if you switch. I guess I'll assume that um, if you're not saying anything, you don't switch. We're all just, uh, we're all just stuck in our ways. Yeah. C kept, Colin was very convincing, I agree. Good job, Colin. Okay, well, I don't think anyone switched. That's fine. Uh, I, 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 I think it put me on the fence, says Robert, so that, that's interesting. Okay, so uh, I, thanks a lot. I, I think we're, we're done with this debate. Oh, Kevin says he switched. And what were you, what were you, you were against? Okay, so Colin, Colin, you win the debate. <laughs> you had one person switch to your side. I lost, dang it. I gotta do a better job of uh, debating next time. Okay, I hope next time I don't have to be the other side. But uh, thanks you guys. On Friday, we will have a lecture, I think. I might try to do some, a little bit of an exercise in class if that means anything to you. Uh, but, you know, we're starting to prepare for the, the next debate after. We'll talk about the labor market in a, in a more, of course, the labor market mattered for this, for this debate too, but I'll be a little bit more specific on Friday. Uh, thank you guys, and I hope to see